Uh, thank you for inviting me to come here. It's kind of a fun treat to be with people that are actually interested in the subject and want to learn about it. I promise I won't give you a quiz. I saw that I had one in my folder, but I won't uh, use that one on you. So our topic for today is the Red Sea and the region and its importance and, and <clears throat> outlook. There's a couple of key things that I want to communicate to you all today. Uh, the first is that the Red Sea is a very important transportation artery. And, and that will hopefully be uh, fairly self-evident. I can give you uh, a little bit of background on that. But it is very important for world trade um, as, a, as a way to connect kind of Asia and Europe. The second thing that I hope you get out of this discussion is there is a lot of conflict around this area, and at the risk of kind of belaboring it, I'm going to quickly <coughs> highlight a lot of the different conflicts going on. And there's conflict at many different levels. You've got conflict within states, conflicts between states, then you've got regional rivalries going on, you've got global rivalries that are going on. So it's kind of a bit like a Rubik's Cube of conflict, if you will, to where all these things are kind of tied together. And that makes it very difficult from a, a policy perspective to, to sort it out and to try to address these issues. The third thing that I hope you get out of this discussion is that because of technological changes, it is increasing the possibility for uh, instability for threats to the Red Sea as a transportation artery. Um, it is becoming easier to project force in a, in a variety of ways, easier to conceal who exactly is projecting force, and so that's uh, something that uh, I hope you'll, uh, you'll get out of this discussion as well. So let me begin and tell you a little bit of background on the uh, uh, the Red Sea as a uh, transportation artery, as you can see, I, I know the map probably can't uh, read it too well, but uh, the Red Sea is critical because it's in some ways kind of a super highway for seaborne traffic, right? And you've got kind of two choke points at either end. You've got at the bottom of, bottom here, the Bab el Manda, the, uh, the Gate of Tears, a relatively narrow passage as you're going into the Red Sea. And then at the top, you have the Suez Canal. And uh, of course, all the traffic flowing in between, and you've got a lot of traffic originating in the Red Sea of uh, seaborne cargo that goes through this. Just, uh, just a little under 10% of all international trade goes through the Suez Canal. So it is an important choke point, and that's substantially more than the, the Panama Canal as a, uh, as a point of of reference. Uh, the oil, of course, is one of the commodities that is sent through the canal. Obviously, the Gulf region is a major oil producing uh, sector. And so you've got a lot of oil that is produced in Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states. And it is shipped through the Red Sea up through the, Red, uh, up through the Suez Canal into Europe, where, of course, there is a, a high demand for energy and all the developed economies that we have in, in Europe. It's an important uh, source of transportation between Asia and Europe, right? You think of all the, the range of products that are manufactured in China, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, right? A lot of those products, if they are being created for markets in Europe, are going to go through the Red Sea. and uh, on into Europe. And it's also a very important gateway for military vessels as, as well. There's, um, again, as we'll come to here, no shortage of conflict in the region. Because of the oil, there is a lot of interest in the, in the region, right? Interest by the US, interest from Russia and China and others, all hoping to secure their energy needs to keep their economies growing. And so it's very important to be able to get the military vessels uh, through the Suez Canal and down the sea and, and back out, right, if you are to have a military presence in the, 
in the region, and a growing number of countries actually do have a military presence there. So there is a lot of transportation needs that are very crucial to the Red Sea, sometimes uh, not recognized, but there's also resources in the Red Sea itself, which is interesting. There are estimates that there's a uh, significant amount of oil and gas that is there that could be potentially <coughs> exploit and so there are questions about how uh, that would work and who would do that and how that would work out. There are uh, a variety of uh, minerals and metals that are in the Red Sea itself that again could be potentially exploited. So all of that kind of adds to the importance of the, <coughs> the region. So again, the Red Sea is a very important transportation artery. Now at the same time, there has been an enormous amount of conflict around the Red Sea. And I'm, I'm going to start off with uh, Israel in the north and kind of work my way counterclockwise as I'm talking about some of the, uh, the conflicts that are going on. So uh, the state of Israel, uh, relatively new, as you probably know, established after World War II. And there were a number of regional wars precipitated by the creation, by the, the declaration of Israel as an independent nation, starting with the War of Independence in 48, which saw Egypt as well as uh, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, you know, most of the, uh, the neighboring Arab countries all declare war on the nation state. Israel emerged victorious from that, but that wasn't the end of the conflict. You had a, uh, another round, uh, over the Suez crisis and, and whether or not the Egyptians were going to nationalize the Suez Canal and gain control of it. The French and the British had uh, control of that to that point. And so Gamal Abdel Nasser was able to successfully uh, nationalize the canal. The British and the French and the Israelis intervened in hopes of preventing that. And even though militarily that operation was successful, the international pressure was tremendous on uh, France and Britain to withdraw, and so they eventually did, and so Egypt was able to gain control of the canal. You had the Six Day War, uh, 1968, right? Another conflict chiefly driven between Egypt and Israel over, uh, again, was Israel going to be a, a permanent state in the region that resulted in a, another victory for Israel? And also in that conflict, Israel gained control over the West Bank and the Golan Heights and the Gaza Strip, which were areas that had been uh, managed by Egypt and Jordan previously, areas that were home to a significant Arab population. And so Israel's victory there gained them control of those territories. And then uh, there was finally another round uh, with the uh, Yom Kippur War, where again, Egypt and, and Israel uh, fought another battle, and Israel again emerged victorious. So a lot of conflict over Israel itself and whether or not it would be established as a state. And those conflicts uh, did bring uh, a lot of concern for the United States because the oil-producing Arab states were beginning to uh, cut back the oil production as a way to try to punish America and the West for its support of Israel in those conflicts, and so the U.S. became very involved in the conflicts between Israel and its neighboring countries. Now, those conflicts came to an end with the Camp David Accords. It was a process and uh, his Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, but in order to try to eliminate the conflicts, which was seen as a threat to the U.S. supply of oil, the U.S. got involved and uh, the agreement finalized under Jimmy Carter essentially saw Egypt agreeing to bury the hatchet and diplomatically recognize Israel as a state. And because Egypt is the largest, uh, the most populous, I should say, uh, Arab state, that once Egypt decided to make peace, all conflicts over Israel's existence were more or less going to come to an end, right? Egypt was the, the country that had the, uh, the greatest potential to militarily defeat Israel, and so in the Camp David Accords, the United States agreed to 
essentially give a, a substantial amount of aid to both Egypt and Israel in exchange for so. But in the process, they could not come to an agreement over what to do with the occupied territories, right? The West Bank, the Gaza Strip, areas where there were a lot of Arabs living that Israel was nominally uh, controlling. And uh, out of a desire to, uh, to, to simply kind of get out of an expensive ongoing conflict, Egypt essentially just washed their hands of it and said, well, we're, we're not uh, going to be concerned about that. And so that triggered another round of conflict for once the, the Arabs in these areas realized that Egypt was no longer going to come to their rescue, was no longer going to uh, defeat Israel and grant them some kind of independence or they would perhaps be governed by Egypt. You got a, another crisis that we're still dealing with today, which is what is the political status of the, the Arabs, the Palestinians, in those territories. They, they really have no legal status uh, today. And so once Egypt and David Accords, you very quickly saw a number of uprisings on the part of the, the Palestinians, the Arabs there, who were demanding uh, some kind of legal recognition. Uh, independence uh, essentially in, in their own <coughs> state. And that conflict continues to simmer and, and boil over from time to time to this day. And, and you know, if you read the news, you'll see this where uh, there is a lot of discussion about should there be an independent Palestinian state? Should there be just an Israeli state? What should that look like? Where should the, the, the borders be? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I'm recalling some of this information correctly, but I just want to offer it. Um, with Egypt uh, and the 1968 war, um, Israel actually uh, uh, occupied some of Israel, uh, Egypt, Egypt yeah. I think up until about the Suez Canal or pretty, pretty far into the Sinai area. Yeah. Um, now, um, that was given back. Egypt. That's the only land um, that Egypt, uh, that Israel gave back. Um, and also, I'm not sure that it's quite correct that Egypt said, well, we're not going to come to you, you know, the, the, the rescue. Egypt had a lot of its own internal problems. I don't think it had the ability to be able to go over and to help the Palestinians and the other people in that area. Well, certainly the, the Egyptians had a, a number of challenges, and the whole reason that their, their motivation in, in making peace was that the financial cost of this conflict uh, was just really crushing their economy. And so, uh, Amar Sadat, uh, yeah, I don't want to take us too off track, but uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser had been seen as a leader of the Pan-Arab movement. He was kind of a, a charismatic guy, right? And he had really committed Egypt to the elimination of Israel as a state. And after he died and Anwar Sadat came in, uh, Sadat was a, a little more, uh, you might say, kind of uh, emotionally disengaged in the uh, conflict. And so he saw it and thought, well, what are we really gaining from this, right? Uh, I don't think that we can actually defeat Israel militarily. It's very expensive to keep trying. And so Sadat actually wanted to forge a peace agreement. But he had this political problem of, well, if he reaches out and if he extends an olive branch to Israel, uh, he's going to look weak, right? Because the, the popular sentiment was very much anti-Israel. And so he did something a bit creative. He decided to establish. And so we had the Yom Kippur War, where he, uh, in, a, in a number of kind of false starts, was able to get some uh, good hits on Israel. And then as soon as the conflict was resolved, he kind of shocked everybody by announcing that he wanted to have this peace agreement. And his, his calculation was is that, OK, now that I've shown everybody I can be a tough guy and fight a war with Israel, then I can go and make peace with Israel. So Egypt certainly had their own uh, interest of why they, they wanted to be out of this, uh, uh, this issue altogether. But uh, the Palestinians had hoped that Israel would at some point be defeated. They had hoped that at some point Egypt would be successful. And when I say they kind of wrote them off, one of, 
Sadat's, you know, going into the negotiations, one of the one of the criteria, one of the things that he was pushing for was that there would be some kind of legal status for the Palestinians. And when it was clear that he wasn't going to be able to get that with the Israelis, he finally just kind of said, "Well, that's fine. We don't." Well, concede that point, and they essentially you know, referred it to a committee, you know, that we studied in further action. And at that point, it was clear that Egypt was no longer going to see itself as the protector of the Palestinians. So that's, that's kind of what I'm referring to, and that caused again a political upheaval on the, the part of the Palestinians. Um, so again, it's an issue that is still going on about is there going to be a independent Palestinian state? If there is, where are the borders going to be? There's still a lot of conflict uh, in Israel at the, the northern end of, uh, of the Red Sea there. Now, Egypt itself, of course, has its own issues that it is dealing with. It's a former British colony in uh, uh, it was a former British colony that ousted the British-supported monarch, right, and Gamal Abdel Nasser, who was a military colonel, came to power through that revolution. And then after uh, he died, he was succeeded, as I mentioned uh, earlier, by Anwar Sadat. Sadat, having negotiated the peace treaty with Israel, assumed that other Arab states would follow his lead. That in his calculation was nobody really has an interest in fighting this war, and even if it's popular by the, the average person on the street, to fall in line. What he miscalculated was the degree to which the, the man on the street would be upset by this policy. And so Saddam was actually assassinated uh, by some military officers in the Egyptian uh, army. And some of you may have seen that, that clip where he's assassinated during the military parade. But after he was assassinated, that kind of froze the regional peace efforts. Uh, everyone was, was too anxious about the political blowback, right, if you, if you established a, a peace settlement with Israel. That opened the door to Hosni Mubarak, who came in. He was a, uh, kind of a, a lower level official. But he came in and was actually able to stabilize Egypt for some time, but at the cost of uh, its economy and its educational and social structures uh, got really a trophy, right? Out of, out of a concern of kind of pushing for any kind of reforms that might upset people, the state became very kind of uh, stolid and uh, the economy was poor. And that eventually culminated in a uprising after the Arab Spring that led to a, a brief experiment with uh, democracy in Egypt, where um, uh, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood and groups that were more favorable towards kind of an Islamic government came to power, and then the, uh, the military essentially stepped back in afterwards. But you have this tension there to where you now have, again, kind of a return since the Egyptian king was overthrown in the 50s. And there's a question about, okay, well, what does the future of Egypt look like? Again, can it reform itself so that its economy can be stronger, so that there are more jobs, there are better educational opportunities? Uh, you know, how long can it continue to be governed uh, you know, rather undemocratically through, you know, by, by the military? And so that is uh, where, where Egypt is at. Now, if you turn uh, and go further down again, working counterclockwise to Sudan, we see uh, an even greater degree of conflict there. Sudan is kind of interesting in that there are a lot of key ethnic and religious divisions in the country. The north is largely Arab, largely Muslim. The south is largely African and non-Muslim. There's a, a mixture of kind of Christian and animist and, and local uh, kind of religions that are followed. And then in western Sudan, you have Africans uh, that are Muslims. And so again, you've got this kind of mix of ethnic religious groups there, and there is a lot of conflict. The Arabs in the north had traditionally government movement in the south by the, the Africans that were non-Muslim to rebel against them. And so after many, many years of conflict and civil war, uh, southern Sudan eventually emerged as an independent country from the northern part of Sudan. 
and then it wasn't long between the different factions in southern Sudan were fighting with each other, and you had civil war in southern uh, Sudan. And so even since southern Sudan gained its independence, you haven't been able to really have a, a stable political regime. You also had a conflict between the Arab Muslims in the north and the African Muslims in the west uh, in Darfur. And so there was a crisis there that in part was kind of driven over control of resources and water and pasture land and whatnot. But that also drew in a lot of international uh, attention. And uh, Sudan was home to a lot of Islamic uh, extremist groups, including Osama bin Laden at one point. So again, you've got a lot of conflict in Sudan over, uh, over the different ethnic and religious groups there. Uh, another kind of uh, similar uh, division, right, where in the uh, north, Eritrea finally was able to break away from Ethiopia after a number of years of conflict. That has uh, somewhat settled down uh, more recently. But again, there are still a fracture there and still tensions between those, those two nations. Uh, working our way around the horn, there was Somalia. Uh, you know, Somalia is kind of an interesting country where you haven't really had much of a central government for, for decades there because of all the conflict. There is a, uh, a number of different factions, a number of different warlords there. Um, the, the central government that was there collapsed in 91, and the country plunged into civil war. You may remember the intervention of the, the US in an effort to try to deliver humanitarian, humanitarian relief there uh, in the 90s, and then the, uh, the, uh, the servicemen that were, that were killed there. Um, there is a, uh, a fragile central government that is now in place there that is uh, trying to get control of, of the country and trying to bring an element of political stability, but it's still very fragile. And uh, Somalia has become home to a number of Islamic extremist groups uh, like Al-Shabaab. Al and so again, you have got another country on the, uh, uh, you know, on the uh, edge of the sea there where there is a lot of uh, challenges. Yemen, uh, I think it's kind of almost depressing to go around all these, but uh, the, uh, Yemen itself, uh, again, moving to the north, is having quite a, a few problems, as, as you probably know, right? It was once divided into north and south Yemen, and there was a uh, kind of a regional conflict there of who was going to support which side, and that it was finally unified in 1990, but then in 2011, the uh, the country was plunged into political instability and civil war uh, over uh, the president and whether or not he was going to retain uh, power. And, and we've seen a, a long going civil war now playing its way out there that has unfortunately become kind of a, uh, a proxy battle, as I'll, I'll talk about more in a, in a bit, but a substantial humanitarian crisis there because of an ongoing civil war and an inability to find a, a resolution uh, to that. Saudi Arabia to the north, uh, in some ways, has been relatively stable politically. The ruling family there um, has been controlling the country for some time. As I'm sure you know, it is a major exporter of, uh, of oil. But there are political challenges. The government there, is dictatorial, right? There is, uh, they don't allow political dissent. Uh, there is not much in the way of freedom of speech or freedom of religion. Now they have from the oil revenue some money that they can use in a sense to provide benefits to the members of the citizens of the state. And in some ways that goes a long way in kind of uh, offsetting the fact that there are not political freedoms. But whenever the price of oil goes down, that revenue starts to shrink. And it, it presents a challenge of if the reason that your citizens are supporting you is because of the you know, relatively lavish benefits that you provide to them, what happens when those benefits stop? And so there's a question in Saudi Arabia about how, how can the government navigate this challenge of 
the, uh, the price of oil, again, can, can go down. They know at some point, of course, the oil revenue, you're gonna have peak production and declines in that, and that's gonna be a challenge. How does the government navigate through that of these different elements in society that have different views of what they, they want the government to look like? And so we've, we've seen the, uh, the current leaders, again, kind of having a few little experiments here and there, but they've still maintained very strong political controls over the country. And that, of course, creates pressure, right? The more that that, um, the more that the government is out of sync with what the, uh, the population wants, the greater that pressure grows. And probably the most significant sign of that was uh, following, following the uh, invasion of Kuwait by Iraq in 1990, there was a, a question of whether or not Iraq was going to turn its military into oil fields in Saudi Arabia. There had been a conflict between Kuwait and Iraq over debt and uh, access to oils and, uh, and whatnot. And so uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and, and as you know, probably the U.S. intervened in that, and they established a military presence in Saudi Arabia, which initially was accepted, uh, you know, there was an understanding of, look, there is this threat that Iraq is a large army, and, and so having the Americans here to uh, counter that, and, and there was a degree of acceptance to that. But following the Gulf War, Saddam Hussein was not removed from power. Uh, there was a, a key kind of decision once they were fighting him, uh, they had expelled him from Kuwait, and there was a question, well, do we continue and drive on into Baghdad and try to replace Saddam himself, or do we call it a day? Uh, simply left him alone that there would be an internal coup or something that would uh, remove him. There was a lot of fears about the consequences of, of removing his regime and, and trying to put something back in there. And so under George H.W. Bush, the, the first uh, Bush, right, they decided not to drive into Baghdad, but Saddam didn't fall from power. And so the threat in some ways remained, and so the U.S. decided to maintain their military presence in Saudi Arabia. And this was extremely controversial among the Saudi population. Um, the Saudis deeply resented an ongoing U.S. military presence, and because there was no way dissent, what you saw was uh, more radical elements began to lead the fight against that. And that essentially is what culminates in 9-11. Osama bin Laden was a uh, wealthy, uh, something of a war hero from the conflict in Afghanistan. His family was well connected with the royal family. And he himself had actually volunteered to lead Saudi Arabia's defenses against Iraq during the, uh, the Gulf War, which is kind of an interesting detail a lot of people don't, don't know. He, he showed up to the, uh, the Ministry of Defense in Saudi Arabia and said, well, I can, I can lead our armies and we don't need the Americans. And they kind of laughed at him and they said, you know, Sama, you don't, you don't have an army. What are you talking about? What, what army are you going to use to go defeat Iraq, which was the fourth largest army in the world at the time? And, you know, of course, he said, well, I, I got followers and I can summon them and, you know, Allah will let's fight the battle and all that. But they, they laughed at him and they invited the Americans to come in. Well, as the American presence became more and more popular, people, and bin Laden uh, essentially came to the point where he decided to declare war on the Saudi royal family. Right? He essentially wanted to start a civil war in Saudi Arabia that presumably would culminate with him becoming the new king or leader or whatever, you know, of Saudi Arabia. But the, the political question he had was, well, if I'm going to try to cause a civil war, uh, if I start attacking Saudis, everyone's going to be upset with me, right? Nobody, nobody likes to see their own countrymen attacked. And so he calculated that if he attacked the Americans, that that would be popular, and so his popularity would increase, and the royal uh, family would come to the defense of the Americans, which would make their popularity decrease, and at some point there would be kind of this popular overthrow the royal family. And so again, that, that culminated in the 9-11 attacks where Bin Laden, essentially in an effort to try to dislodge the royal family out of Saudi Arabia, began attacking uh, American uh, targets around the world. Now, obviously that effort 
failed and bin Laden is now dead, but there still continues to be this kind of simmering uh, political tension in Saudi Arabia over uh, its, its future, right? Because again, there is not a, a democratic uh, regime there. There's no outlet for, for political dissent. So that, uh, that kind of quickly recaps a lot of the uh, uh, internal uh, conflicts that you have going on in the state, the state to state conflicts. But overlapping these conflicts, you have a set of regional conflicts, which again complicates everything. So you obviously have a tension between Israel and its neighbors in the north, right? Even though Egypt has uh, established peace with Israel, there are still these tensions over what to do. We see recently Turkey has become more engaged in the Middle East. Turkey's traditional policy was to, to face Europe, if you will, to try to be more engaged in European politics. It made a, a big effort to join. The effort was not going to uh, succeed. Turkey kind of turned its attention the other way and decided to focus on the Middle East, the East. And there is a separatist movement among the Kurds who feel like they have no place in the Turkish state. And from the perspective of the Turkish government, they consider these to be terrorists, and they, they even deny that they're actually, you know, ethnically different uh, from uh, uh, from your, your you know regular Turks. So there is an ongoing conflict there between the separatist Kurds in the east and the um, the Turkish government. But that's not the only place that you find Kurds. There is a large number of Kurds in northern Iraq. There are a large number of Kurds in Syria. And the instability in Iraq and Syria raised the possibility of an independent Kurdish state forming somewhere to the south of Turkey. And that, that was terrifying uh, for the government of Turkey because they saw that as, well, that, that will simply become a base to aid and support uh, the Kurdish separatists in Turkey and <coughs> eventually culminate in us losing a piece of our territory. And so you've seen Turkey increasingly engaged in the region in an effort to try to prevent the establishment of an independent uh, Kurdish state, either in Iraq or, or Syria. And so some of the, uh, the conflicts that have been in the news lately because of the, the role that it's, it's playing there. Probably the most important regional dynamic, however, is between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The two countries on the surface have a lot of similarities, right? They're both fairly dictatorial. They are both uh, kind of radical Islamic governments with uh, very few political or religious liberties. But there are some key differences. The uh, Saudi Arabian government is staunchly pro-American. The Iranian government is staunchly anti-American, right? So there's a, a global uh, difference there. The Iranians are Shia Muslims, while the Saudis are Sunni Muslims, and so there's a religious difference there, and there's a lot of kind of bad blood uh, between these uh, these two different segments of Islam, and so that kind of adds to the crisis. But then there's also just some real questions of, of power, right? Of who's going to control what? Traditionally in the region, Iraq, and so you would see the uh, the tensions between. Uh, Iraq under Saddam Hussein and the, uh, the clerics in Iran, and they, you know, they, they fought a lengthy war against each other. One of the uh, unintended consequences of the U.S. going into Iraq is that Iraq had been ruled by a Sunni minority, but a majority of the population was Shia. Well, if you go in and you remove the Sunni minority and you have an election, what do you get? Well, of course, the Shia majority comes to power. So the US essentially stripped power from the Sunnis and handed it to the Shias. Well, the Shias in Iraq have a, a much closer affinity to Iran than the Sunnis. And so while the Sunnis kind of saw the Saudis as their natural allies, the Shias tend to see Iran as their natural allies. And so this opened the door for Iran to play a and uh, to be involved during the Iraq War and, and afterwards, and uh, you know, to try to support a, a number of militia groups there, which uh, is, is resented, of course, by some of the Iraqi population, but it nevertheless is effective in 
influencing its politics. Similarly, Iran has also established support for Hezbollah in Lebanon, which gives it kind of a, a proxy group next to Israel so that it can exert influence over, uh, over politics that are occurring with Israel and the, the conflict with the, the Palestinians. Once Iraq was kind of weakened through the Iraq war and allowed Iran to exert more influence, Saudi Arabia kind of stepped up its efforts to serve as the counterweight. And so you see increasing hostilities and tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and that has played out most directly in Yemen, uh, where you see essentially a proxy fight is, is carrying out with the Iranians supporting the Houthis and the, uh, the Saudis opposing that. And so the, the conflict there, again, is, is kind of played out on that uh, dynamic. And, and what you've seen is that Saudi Arabia has been going to many of the countries around the Red Sea and essentially trying to force them to take sides on this issue and say, look, we want you to uh, take sides and uh, show. So those are, again, some of the regional conflicts that are superimposed over the local conflicts. And then you have global conflicts, right? And yet another layer on top of that. And, and here we've seen a number of interesting developments. One is that uh, Russia under Vladimir Putin has become much more assertive. Uh, Russia's key client state in the region is Syria under Bashar uh, Assad. And when a civil war broke out in Syria, we saw Russia uh, offer substantial support to the Assad regime. And that, that effort was ultimately successful in fending off the civil war. The United States was rather conflicted over how it should deal with this because on the one hand it didn't like the, uh, the pro-Russian Assad regime. On the other hand, the opposition groups had a mixture of Islamic extremists in it and so they weren't excited about that uh, and it was difficult to find a kind of uh, a, a significant group that you could support that, that kind of reflected uh, more American values, if, if you will. But uh, Russia was able to extend its influence in the region through that conflict and kind of, uh, to an extent, coming to the rescue of the uh, Assad regime. Finally, see China getting involved as well, right? The transportation artery there is very important for the Chinese. They have ambitions to have a, a growing military presence. They've actually established a military base in, uh, uh, in Djibouti here, uh, their first overseas military base. Djibouti's home actually to about half a dozen or so military bases, so they seem to kind of welcome one and welcome all. But uh, you, have the, you have the Chinese establishing a presence there, and under their Belt and Road Initiative, which is an effort to uh, essentially build up the infrastructure capabilities so that uh, Chinese goods and potentially Chinese military vessels uh, will have an easier go of maneuvering around the region. Uh, you, we've seen them getting involved as well. And so the U.S. is faced with this question, well, how do we respond to it? At present, the, uh, the policy has been very much kind of on an ad hoc basis. Uh, there isn't necessarily an overarching strategy for the region. It's, it's rather kind of the, the whack-a-mole game of dealing with each little problem as it, as it comes up because it's, it's relatively low on the, uh, the administration's list of priorities. And so there's, there's a question there about what, what should the U.S. policy be, uh, because at, at present, again, there's, there's not really a defined policy. You know, the U.S. is obviously very leery of greater Russian influence, obviously very leery of greater Chinese influence, but what, what can you do? So a substantial amount of conflict and Lastly, I, I want to get to the third point about the way that technology is in some ways kind of providing sparks to this powder keg. Um, technology is allowing a greater range of uh, weapons, many of which are more subtle. So for example, cyber attacks, right? If a cyber attack occurs, it is often difficult to understand who actually was behind the attack, right? And sometimes they try to trace it back and so on, but it's not quite as explicit as, you know, as if there's a tank, you know, coming at the battle, charging at you, and you know, you know whose flag is on the tank and all that. In similar fashion, we see the development of 
uh, autonomous weapons, right? Drones that are relatively inexpensive compared to the price of a, uh, a fighter jet uh, can be launched from relatively modest facilities, right? So you can, you can have a, a drone that gets kind of rolled out of a shed or something, right? And then takes off, and so you don't necessarily need a, a large airfield for that. And we're beginning to see drone attacks on different uh, points of infrastructure in the region. And so as these capabilities increase, as the ability uh, for the drones to kind of carry out attacks, there's a question of what if drones attack ships that are passing through uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Babel Mendev there, right? As they're entering the, the Red Sea. And you might not even know necessarily who, who launched the attack. Right? You might have a, a drone attack an oil tanker, and it might succeed, and perhaps the drone took off from Yemen, but you don't know for sure exactly who did it. You might suspect, well, maybe it was the Houthis, maybe it was Iran that was ultimately behind it, but it can be very challenging to understand exactly where that, where that attack originated from, who was behind that. And likewise, we see that the uh, the range and the lethalness of uh, land-based missiles is increasing. Right? There is uh, a lot of discussion these days about, uh, you know, let's take an example, a, a missile that you might be able to launch from the coast. It flies a thousand miles and sinks an aircraft carrier. All right, we're, we're on the, uh, the edge of a, a revolution in uh, military affairs, as they call it, where the weapons that we have been familiar with for quite some time are giving way to a new class of weapons that are probably going to make a lot of the older weapons obsolete, you know, in the way that tanks kind of offset uh, machine guns and aircraft carriers offset battleships. Well, these type of long-range <coughs> missiles might offset the, the usefulness of an aircraft carrier because if you've got a billion dollars sunk in an aircraft carrier, but, you know, a, a $10,000 missile sinks it. Uh, that's, that's a problem, especially, again, if you can't be sure where, where the missile really originated from or who shot it. And again, this, these might be the kinds of weapons, again, you could smuggle into the country, you could fire it. Uh, again, Somalia, Yemen, yeah, there's a lot of places where the um, there's political instability is so great that it would be very difficult to try to figure out who, who fired it, right, and, and who, who sank. what. And so there's a lot of discussion, uh, a lot of speculation that the, the next major war that we see, there's going to be a lot of fighting in what they call the gray zone, where you don't really know what was aggression and what you know who was behind it. And uh, a little foretaste of that was the uh, the recent conflict with Iran and the, uh, uh, the assassination of Soleimani. Right, if you saw that in the news, the U.S. carried out a, a targeted attack against a, a very high-profile. Uh, Iranian general who was in Iraq, and it was clear that, okay, the U.S. had carried out that attack, and so Iran was in this kind of curious position of, well, uh, kind of for, for honor's sake, they needed to respond, but they knew if they responded too harshly, it would provoke an even greater escalation that they weren't prepared to back up. And so we saw an interesting kind of maneuver where they launched rockets at a uh, U.S military base in Iraq, and the, the missiles proved that they had the capability of launching those, but they, they made enough signal noise before they launched the rockets that everybody kind of knew they were coming, and so everybody was able to kind of get to the bunkers, and there were actually no American lives lost, which from the Iranian standpoint was kind of a calculated success, right? They, they were able to launch the rockets and say, there, we, we got you back for killing Soleimani, uh, but the, the repercussions weren't so great that there was going to be another wave coming from the U.S. And now everybody's waiting for the other foot to drop, right? What is the real response from Iran going to be, whether it's the assassination of a U.S. senator or a U.S. general? And again, uh, a bomb goes off or a rocket hits and nobody's really sure where it came from. And the Iranians can have kind of plausible deniability. So it's this kind of conflict that could very easily uh, capture the region and lead to you know, threats about the, the transportation of military vessels to the region because, again, these choke points are quite, quite narrow and if there's a lot of political instability and a lot of different groups off control of the central government, 
um, it's a uh, it's a very challenging situation. So uh, again, the three points I, I hope that you've gotten out of this uh, kind of drink from the fire hose of the, the Red Sea <laughs> is that it's a very important transportation artery. There is a lot of conflict around the region, and because of technology, in some ways, it's kind of a tinderbox waiting to, to go off. And so we'll we'll have to see how things play out. Are there uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> your question about there's a lack of a, or your statement that there's a lack of an overall strategy. With what you just laid out with the layers, and we just had another speaker that talked about India, Pakistan, their relations, China, and I would also throw in all the millions of uh, immigrants that are going to Europe, from the Middle East, from North Africa, I don't see how you could develop them. Yeah, if, even if it was strategy. your number one foreign policy objective, it's a very challenging <laughs> region to try to sort out what, what do you do. Yeah. yeah. Well, since we really followed up in Iran many, many years ago when the CIA kept a few people around, but actually we are more attuned to dealing with the people in Iran, not the leaders in Iran, but the people in Iran. And since we no longer need oil from Saudi Arabia, we don't need the Arabs. Why don't we try to figure out a way to get along with Iran? And take Kurdistan, the fourth country that came out of the Middle East, where the French and the Russians and the British tore up the neighborhood so many years ago. Yeah, so there's, there's a number of challenges. One is that even you know, the US gets most of its oil from Mexico and Canada and, and Venezuela. But because oil is a global commodity, an interruption in production or transportation in the Gulf will still increase the, the price that we pay at the pump here. So there's, there's a challenge there. Now, some have argued that, look, the more we get engaged in the region, the more problems we cause, right? That our, our efforts are counterproductive. And, and certainly, you can look at a lot of policy missteps. The challenge there is that if you disengage and essentially allow Russians and the Chinese to have greater influence, uh, potentially even allow Islamic fundamentalist groups to come to power. What does that world look like? You know, and, and again, what does that do to our energy needs if you've got that kind of shift in the um, uh, in the in the Middle East? And so it's it's a challenging, a challenging area to navigate for sure. Uh, yeah, but uh, Saudi Arabia have an army. Yes. And if so, why don't they take care of Yemen? Well, the, uh, <laughs> it's kind of like saying, why, why didn't we take care of Vietnam, right? It's, <laughs> it's challenging and that even though Saudi Arabia has military capabilities and they're certainly very invested in the region, you're fighting a civil war and the Iranians are backing the other side. And so it's a, it's a that's proxy a long, battle. That's a long way from uh, Iran to get there. Well, the long coast, so it's, it's easy to, to ship weapons in. And again, it's very similar to any proxy war, whether it's Vietnam or Afghan Afghanistan, right? If there's a genuine civil war going on on the ground, to get involved in that and, and try to force one to have, you know, to be dominant over the other is it's challenging, especially when, again, the other side is getting support from, from somebody that has weapons uh, yeah. Uh, from what I understand now is that the United States is uh, energy independent. It's uh, oil production. So uh, technically, you don't need uh, the Middle East as much. Uh, well, I however, you know, the, I mean, the, the, there are because of our um, petroleum uh, production plants. They only handle like a lighter oil, and that comes from Saudi Arabia. There's a lot of dynamics that are going on there. But um, my major point, though, is that the United States has caused, in a way, its own problems. Because it's tried to take what we have here and impose it on over there, rather than learning about the people's culture and, and, and working that way. Many uh, decades ago, there were a lot of Iranians that were coming to the United States for education. And, you know, we have allies in them, but we don't use them. Well, and, and one of the 
one of the challenges for U.S. policy in the region is there is continually this conflict between what you might call our values and our interests. Uh, with Iran, for example, right? this is a, a, an issue that Jimmy Carter faced. Uh, the Shah of Iran was undoubtedly not a nice guy. Right? I mean, he was uh, enforcing his will on the population. He consolidated political control. He had a secret police. There was genuine, legitimate grievances uh, against him. And when the protests start, you know, the phone essentially at the White House rings and says, okay, do you want me to shoot the protesters or do you want me to leave? And there's a debate, right? I mean, it's in our interest to shoot the protesters, right? Shoot the protesters, continue to have a pro-American government in Iran uh, that will supply you with oil and, and whatnot. But again, there's, there's a, a value question there. Are, are we going to support that even if it's in our interest? Uh, Carter, as an evangelical Christian, really struggled with, with some of these kinds of things. And he kind of decided to not decide and let events take its own course. And that, that culminated with the, the Ayatollah Khomeini coming to power um, after the, the Shah fled. You know, and again, this is just one of many examples, but it's the challenge you face of where, uh, where in a sense, allowing the, the population to have a greater voice in the, uh, in the politics of the region would probably mean you know, the U.S. interests would be set back because there would be more Islamic governments and more anti-American governments. Yeah? There's one factor in that, and that's the religious factor, that as far as the Muslims are concerned, whether it's Sunni or Shiite, we are all infidels. And in the Quran, it teaches that they can get along with the, the Christian, that the Christian has a lot of power. But if you're, if you're non Muslim, the Muslim's duty is to take over wherever they can at any time they can do it. Yeah, the, the religious dimension is, is very complicated. Um, the, the, best, the best analogy I can come up with is, you know, imagine if the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages had declared, we're done with theology. We, we don't have any more questions to answer. We're not even going to do theology anymore. We've answered every question. And the answers we have are on the books on the shelf. If you need the answer, go look it up. Right? That's essentially what Islam did. Right? Uh, Islam essentially closed the, uh, formally closed down the process of theology in the Middle Ages. And a lot's changed since then. <laughs> There's a lot of questions that didn't come up in the Middle Ages. And because there isn't an official answer, what that has led to is in some ways a Protestant Reformation in Islam, where now anybody, and Bin Laden's a perfect example, right? He was not trained as any kind of a cleric. He was an engineer. Right? I mean, he had no background in religious scholarship, religious teachings, and all of this, you know, on the surface. He was in no way qualified to offer any kind of religious interpretation of the Quran, which you weren't supposed to do anyway, because again, theology was closed. But because nobody else is there to offer interpretations, he starts offering interpretations. And it's kind of like the random guy in church that says, oh, I've, I've read parts of the Bible. Here's what I think it means. Um, you have these ideas coming, and, and there's a broad range of, of views, right? And a lot of them, they go back and say, well, no, we need to go back to the, you know, the Islam that they had in the Middle Ages. And that is very brutal in some cases. And we see that with ISIS and other groups. And so it's, it's difficult because there's, there is, again, such a diversity of, of views. And, um, and again, some of these ideas are, are really kind of just lightning rods for anti-American, you know, sentiments because of the what religion are the Kurds? Uh, is they're Muslims. They're Muslims. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, speaking of Kurds, you know, you have that Kurdish population in southern Turkey and Syria and uh, Iraq, I believe it is. What is there uh, in that part of the country geographically that these countries, you know, are not willing to say, okay, the Kurds occupy this area? you know, to a nation state in that area. So what is there, uh, mineral wealth, or what is there in the land that would uh, make these other countries say, no, even though it's your ethnic area, you cannot have a nation state? Well, country, countries never like to cede territory. 
even if the territory is uh, so it's power? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, at one power level, power. it's as simple as no country, I mean, it's like, again, would, would the United States voluntarily give up New Mexico or something like that, right? I mean, you have this kind of issue. Um, what, what, in a sense, created the problem was uh, World War I. So you had uh, the Ottoman Empire, right, during World War I, it was a, a large empire that included uh, Anatolia and uh, the Gulf, and there was a mixture of People there, you had Arabs, you had Kurds, you had Christians, you had Greeks, you had you know, a whole range of things. And then after World War I, uh, most of the empire was stripped away from the Ottoman, uh, you know, from the Ottoman government, and what was left was kind of this rump state that we know of now as Turkey. And Kamal Ataturk said that basically he wanted Turkey to be, you know, European, secular, and Turkish. And it was made Turkish in part through uh, ethnic cleansing that occurred where they, they wiped out the Armenians. It was made in part through forced migrations where they basically made all the Greeks go back over to Greece. But then you had this large Kurdish population and, and he, he kind of had a question, well, do, do we go and just kill them? Do we go and try to push them somewhere? If we push them somewhere, where are we going to push them to? So what they did is they, they essentially just declared them to be mountain Turks and said, well, you're, you're Turk too, you just don't realize it. And then the, uh, the other borders, right, that were drawn, I mean, sometimes there's a joke that they were drawn by Winston Churchill, it's not too terribly inaccurate. Uh, but the, the borders that were essentially drawn by the French and the British following World War I didn't take into consideration the ethnic breakdown in the region, right? It took into consideration their, their political interests. But not the, what was that? Kurdish language. Yeah, it's a separate language. Okay. It's separate from Turkish. Yeah. It's the communist fault. Originally during the World War One, there was a determination about to break up the Middle East, and in that, with the Russians on hand and the British and the French, there were but as you say, Winston Churchill purposely put together states that would not unite. He purposely mixed people together to make it unstable. Divide and conquer. <laughs> yeah, and, and one of the challenges, you know, they, they had a proposal, uh, as you alluded to after World War I, to have an independent Kurdish state, um, but it was, uh, in a sense, rejected by the Turks. And so when again, Kamal Ataturk led the, uh, uh, essentially, you know, rebelled and then took power, it came down to a question of the battlefield, right? And who is who is willing to go and fight on the ground to to establish a a, a Kurdish state? And again, the French and the British, the Americans, they all just fought a war. They're not interested in fighting another war, let alone over there. They actually offered uh, America a. Uh, uh, a mandate. They, they essentially invited and said, well, you know, let's have a military presence in Turkey after World War I to uh, kind of secure some of this. And uh, it was kind of a non-start because nobody wanted to, to make a long-term commitment to the Middle East, especially in 1919. All right, our time is up.